So I'd like to introduce uh, Paul Biles, who's our facilitator for this webinar on the economic impact report that has been completed. Paul Biles is the founder and director of FTS, which provided regulatory economic and management consulting services. He's an experienced economist and finance professional, having worked in the finance industry for over 25 years. He has carried out numerous economic impact studies relating to the Cayman Islands over the past 15 years. It was my pleasure to work with Paul when he was past, he's a past president of the chamber and I've had the pleasure of working with him. He holds a master's degree in economic development from the London School of Economics and a master's degree in economics from Bur Burbeck College in the UK, as well as a bachelor's degree from Pace University in New York. In New York. So thanks, thanks Paul for co-hosting this event and I'm just gonna turn it over to you for your presentation. And just by the way, before I turn it over to Paul, if you have any questions, you can um, obviously wait to the end of his presentation, or you can actually include them in the chat, and I'll review those. And when we go to the question and answer period, I'll, I'll, I'll facilitate those questions for Paul, or you can raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. So take it away, Paul. All right, thanks, Will. Appreciate that, and good morning, everyone. Um, so we're, we're going to talk a, a little bit about the report that uh, the Chamber recently commissioned. I know many of you have seen uh, or heard of bits of it uh, in, in newspaper and in the media coverage um, just after it was launched. But I'm going to try today to give you a really good summary of all the key points uh, in the, the study. And uh, hopefully that will be useful. And then at the end, we will um, open up for a Q&A session, which uh, Will will, uh, he will uh, moderate. So let's get started. Um, topics we're gonna cover, uh, we're obviously gonna talk a little bit about why the chamber decided to do this. Um, the approach to the study, be very brief on that. Try not to be, uh, have too much jargon, it'll be too technical. And then we will get straight into what we're supposed to get into today, which is the, to discuss the impact on the economy um, look at the impact on jobs, employment, how this has impacted uh, people in our community, as well as the vulnerable and, and how um, the vulnerable have been affected as well. So I thought before we got started on discussing the economic impact, um, you want I would to just share your screen, Paul, if you don't mind. Sorry? Just share your screen. Thought it was so shared. They can see the presentation. So I have it, currently have it shared. Are you saying no one is seeing it? Okay, all right, fine, thanks Paul. All right. Um, you guys have a, a, a little reaction button, I think somewhere on the screen, so you can do a, I think you can do a thumbs up. So if, if you want to do a thumbs up, you can go ahead and do that at any point if you think that I'm really funny or something or I'm, I, I give you a joke, or if you can see, see your screen properly, like Will is asking now, you can also do a thumbs up so I can see that. All right, so I thought that one way to get started would be to look at um, how this crisis differs from one that uh, many of us are all too familiar with, which is Hurricane Ivan. And so you see there, I have a little slide up on how Ivan compared to COVID. Um, Ivan, uh, resulted in a lot of very physical destruction and, and have obviously had a mental impact on, on all of us. Um, COVID-19 had pretty much no physical destruction, but obviously it also has a, a mental impact. Ivan lasted for around 50 hours. Um, that would be the full time span, which I think was 50 or 50 to 60 hours. Um, this COVID-19 will be with us for, it looks like, at least six months based on the recent announcements by the government in terms of when um, our borders might be uh, reopened, which I, I, I think you've all heard it might be around September 1st. Um, although that could be a moving target and hopefully we, we all hope it will be sooner. Um, Ivan felt life-threatening for, well, some people it might have been a lot longer than 30 hours, but Ivan didn't last that long. But there was a particular period from, I think, early Sunday morning right through that day when Ivan was, was 
pretty serious. And um, I would say it probably felt life-threatening. It certainly did for me. It felt life-threatening um, during that period. Um, COVID-19 has felt life-threatening for the past six weeks, I believe, fair to say. And probably it will be for, for longer for some persons as well, as long as they, you know, they feel like they're, they're still that, that health risk is still there. Um, two other, three other quick points. The airport closed for about four days in Ivan. Um, we closed, I think it was on Friday, and then we didn't really have any flights, uh, any ability to fly out until I think the, the Monday, which was after um, Sunday was the worst day. And then Monday we started to kind of slowly recover. Um, and COVID-19 will be closed for many months. We've been closed for a little while now, and it looks like we won't be reopened for another uh, three months at least. Um, Ivan, in the case of Ivan, we could all go back to work as long as the workplace was in good physical condition. Um, as long as we had electricity, uh, you know, air conditioning, and we had an office space and it was clean and there was no water, in theory, we could all go back to work. Um, in the case of COVID-19, there's nothing wrong with our workplace. Um, no physical damage anywhere. There's no water anywhere, but we're just not allowed to go. We're not allowed to leave home. We must stay home um, mostly, aside from those three days that we're allowed to leave to, to go and run those errands. Um, but we have to pretty much stay home. Ivan's estimated damage was 2.8 billion. Um, COVID's damage, I would say it's uncertain, although we're going to discuss some of that today. But it's the kind of damage that is not going to happen, you know, all in the first couple of weeks or a few months. It will happen over a few years. We're likely to be still recovering from this um, probably two years from now. We'll still be talking about recovering from this. So the full impact is uncertain. And just the uh, last slide on that a little picture. Um, the two pictures on the left uh, are actual pictures of uh, Hurricane Ivan's destruction. And the three pictures on the right um, are pictures, very recent pictures of, in this new uh, pandemic. And there's no one in any of the pictures. Um, but for totally different reasons. So in case of Ivan, there's no one in the pictures because it's, it's uh, this total destruction and it's not safe for anyone to be there. And the, on the right side, those images, there's no one in the pictures because we just have to basically stay home and that just reflects em, uh, emptiness. So it, and my summary of it is sort of destruction versus sort of uh, emptiness, um, physical destruction versus just not being able to do anything. So why do the study? Um, the Chamber commissioned the study because uh, what just occurred, what occurred uh, six weeks ago was an unprecedented event, um, very different to a major hurricane, so we need to better understand what we're facing. Um, the ne negative impact is obvious. I mean, if you asked anybody what was the impact of COVID-19, they would say it would be very bad for the economy and people would lose lots of jobs. But the question is, in what areas and by how much? The other reason for the chamber doing it was, you know, how can you offer solutions uh, to something if you're not quite sure how, where the impact has been and, and how, how everyone has been impacted. Uh, we also need to think about the future. Um, you will hear a very cliche term, which is the post COVID new normal. Everyone is using it. So I guess I'm allowed to use it as well. Um, so what can we learn from what just occurred in terms of helping us not just to recover, but also to be more resilient in the future? And the study does touch on some of that as well. What was the approach to the study? Uh, I won't bore you with anything too technical, but basically what I did was I looked at the data from the Economics and Statistics Office, all of their official data. Um, we also conducted a survey of over 300 local businesses and then I use standard economic theory and the methodologies for impact studies um, to understand how Cayman's uh, economy was impacted. Um, one really nice thing about this study was that second point on this slide there, which was the survey of local businesses, because in addition to having the sort of macroeconomic data, um, I was able to use direct information from businesses to understand what's happening on the ground. And I was very pleased to see that a lot of what we were hearing from businesses was sort of gelling very nicely with what you were expecting in terms of the economic theory. So that was one uh, very good result. And it, act and it makes the study really that much stronger than simply 
um, collecting data and just doing desk research, which is not, not what we did. There were three scenarios in the study. Um, those three scenarios are shelter in place scenarios. Um, the idea behind having these scenarios is that we really don't know um, how long we're going to be in this. Um, we have no idea how long we're going to be under these shelter in place uh, measurements. And it, it sort of, it can change week to week. It can change day to day, depending on how the, the disease develops within our community. Um, so I did three scenarios, which was two months, March to May. In all of these uh, periods, we're talking about roughly around the end of March, the last week of March onward. So March to May means uh, basically April and May. The three months um, scenario was April to June and the four month scenario assumes that uh, we're in this lockdown until end of July. So what's the impact? Uh, the first sort of high level impact that uh, is discussed, uh, which is just a, ne a necessity, um, you have to think about the Cayman Islands as, uh, as a company. And if you think about it as, as a company, so Cayman Inc, Cayman Limited, and you like to understand how the company has been impacted. One of the very first things you want to understand is whether that company is able to, to produce anything, to deliver any services or serve any customers. Uh, what is the company's output? What's its revenue? What's its profit? And so for a country, the way you measure that is by looking at the GDP. The GDP tells us um, what is the value that this uh, economy is creating each year. And so that's referred to as the gross domestic product, okay? And so in this case, what's predicted um, is that under a two month lockdown, we will have uh, approximately 15% decline in our economy. And this assumes that we are comparing 2020 to 2019 in all of these scenarios. So we're looking at this to say, okay, if we were in a lockdown for two months, what will be the general impact on the economy for the year, for the rest of the year? So for 2020, we will be at 15% decline compared to 2019. That's what would happen. If we were in a lockdown for three months, it would be even more damaging for our economy. And then at the end of 2020, when we looked at how we produced and what we created in our country, it would be about 19% less than last year. And if we assumed a four month lockdown, this would be a 22% decline. As I mentioned, one of the nice things about the study was the survey of local businesses. And this was a really good guide to what was happening on the ground. Um, this is just, I'm gonna give you a bit of a summary on what, what some of those results are. Uh, 20 businesses said that they were like, likely to close within the next four weeks. 130 businesses had already made adjustments. Um, that was that means from around middle of March um, to middle of, of, of April. Uh, 85 businesses had made no changes. What I would say about these results is that although 130 businesses made adjustments to downsize and to survive, uh, they gave us that result around 17th of April. So by today, that situation may be a lot different. It may be that they've made adjustments to downsize and survive, but it may be that some of, some of them have decided that they're likely to close. So they're in the top, the top level now with tw joining those 20 businesses. We, we don't know because we haven't done a follow-up survey. But that's just to say this was actually the position on April 17th. 85 businesses made no changes. Um, they were sitting tight. They felt that they were okay for now. They hadn't made any, any big decisions. Just to give you an idea of those businesses that said they were likely to close, um, this may actually be very representative um, because it does reflect the general results on the sectors throughout the report, which I'll get into in a bit. But of the 20 businesses that likely to, to close, they were from the tourism the other, which was sort of miscellaneous and small business retail sectors, construction and restaurant sectors. So you can see there, there were five tourism businesses, five restaurant related businesses, six construction businesses, and four other businesses 
um, that said they were likely to close in the next one to four weeks. Um, perhaps a slightly more uh, value added information is the, are the zeros because it tells us that none of the financial services businesses uh, surveyed at the time um, felt that there was uh, that much risk that they would close down in the next four weeks. None of the companies in the uh, ICT, uh, telecommunications and technology sector, said they would close. And none of the companies in the healthcare sector said they would close. And that, that sort of shouldn't make a lot of common sense to us, that those businesses are likely to be in a, in a stronger position during a pandemic. People are going to be working from home. So we expect the ICT, telecoms, and technology companies to be quite busy helping everyone to do that. Uh, obviously, healthcare, the majority, not all, but the majority of healthcare businesses are probably still going to have uh, stuff to do because people are going to want to come and see them. And they, are in, they were always included from the very beginning in the um, exempted businesses that would be identified as essential. So you could always go to visit your doctor and so on. And financial services has um, very strong capacity, always did, to work remotely. They uh, very heavy technology focused anyway. And um, so they, they were able to function even in the face of the, the crisis. Impact on employment. One of the interesting results of the survey, which was very powerful, very strong, very glaring, was the fact that between March 13th and April 17th, um, 1,416 uh, persons had already lost their jobs. And that number is taken from our sample and our sample, all of the companies in the sample employed around 9,000 9, employees. And the total amount of persons typically employed in the current labor market is closer to 40,000. So what that tells you is that the job losses between March 13th and April 17th is likely to have been uh, more than 1,416 employees. Uh, because we didn't capture all of the companies that, that were employing everyone at the time. Um, in our, uh, in the job impact, uh, the non Caymanians in the best case scenario, which is the two month um, lockdown, we would lose about uh, 5,088 non Caymanian jobs, those are work permits, and we would lose 5,624 uh, Caymanian jobs. That's in the best case scenario. So assuming that we're only out for, uh, for two months. Um, we're coming up to that two months now because essentially at the, at the end of, of May, um, we were still, if we haven't opened up, we will still be on lockdown for two months. Um, thankfully, what we are seeing is that um, as of Monday this week, a number of other businesses were allowed to, uh, to operate and we're kind of easing back into the economy. So hopefully the, the final impact is not going to be as bad as, as we estimated here. We're expected to lose almost 11,000 jobs under a two month lockdown and 12,450 jobs under a three month lockdown. And if we don't, if we didn't open up until the 1st of July, we would lose um, over 14,000 jobs. All of these jobs are across all the different sectors. Survey of the local businesses showed that 145 indicated that at least one Caymanian job is at risk. Um, and of the local businesses, none of them indicated that more than um, 100 Caymanian jobs were at risk. But for the 145, um, the number of employees ranged from one to three up to sort of over 100 employees. And there were a few companies that had over 100 employees. And in those cases, there were, those companies were saying that that number of persons um, were likely to lose their job. So what I'll explain. So for example, the few companies that, ha that said um, they employed hundreds of employees, they were saying, all of those companies were saying that over a hundred Caymanian jobs were at risk in each of their major companies. So while it's 145 companies that said at least one job is at risk, um, lots of companies had more than one Caymanian job at risk. 
so the the the, the likely job fallout was potentially very large uh, as estimated at the time. This is what that picture looks like in terms of the industry. I think it's always interesting to see how the industries um, are reacting to this, responding to this. So you will see that um, this is not unexpected um, based on the uh, sl two slides ago, but financial services, only 20% of financial services firms felt that any Caymanian jobs were at risk. Similar low number, 25% of the healthcare firms felt that Caymanian jobs were at risk. And I should clarify something here. Although the healthcare sector isn't expected to be impacted greatly, um, there are health healthcare providers who are not able to see their clients. A, because the clients are not coming out as often, not able to leave home as often, and B, because they may not be able to service them. Um, if it's not an emergency, they won't be able to provide the other services by telemedicine. C, even if they are able to provide telemedicine and maybe your doctor could see you on a you know, Zoom screen, um, in some cases, insurance companies are not covering that type of uh, delivery of service. So some healthcare providers are going to, to, to suffer. So it's not surprising that 25% of the healthcare sector said they might lay someone off, even though we don't think they're going to be impacted greatly. ICT, 43%. And then the others are what we are expecting, which is construction, um, restaurant sector, tourism sector, and the small business retail sector. They're all, uh, have, uh, all showing that a very high percentage of, of those companies are um, seeing Caymanian's jobs at risk. Not sure what's happening here, but my slide isn't working. Um, local businesses, uh, 142 indicate that at least one work permit holder is at risk. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to do something with my slides because I wanna make sure I haven't actually missed anything important because I had a little glitch just now. Okay, sorry. Um, so 142 businesses said at least one work permit holder's job is at risk. Again, the same disclaimer as I gave before. Remember that a lot of companies are employing a lot more than one work permit holders. And they also said that um, lots of jobs were at risk in those areas, whether it's seven to 12 jobs or 25 to 50 jobs or over 50 jobs. There were lots of companies giving those numbers as well. So this is just the minimum to say that all of those said at least one would be at risk, but some of them said over 50 would be at risk. And a few companies said, as you see, there were three larger companies that said that more than 100 jobs were at risk in each of those companies as well. Again, this is a sample representing um, you know, only around 18% of the labor force. And therefore, um, it's very likely that there are other companies with a you know, similar sentiment in regarding jobs at risk. Sector view um, on that work permit holders um, perspective. Again, financial services and healthcare, fairly low percentage of those companies um, said there was a, a work permit holder at risk. And then the other sectors very high from 70 through to 94% um, saying that work permit holders were at risk. In general, um, the difference between work permit holders and Caymanians um, wasn't that significant. Um, so companies were looking at what workers they could keep, what workers they had to get rid of. And in doing so, um, the final result is that it looks like um, slightly more work permit holders jobs at risk, but very similar a ratio for Caymanians versus work permit holders in terms of losing jobs. Community support. Um, I did reach out to a few of the, the key charities, not wasn't able to reach out to all of them, but the main ones here, uh, you can see Cayman Food Bank. Um, you're seeing this on Facebook almost every day. So their meal support had doubled. Uh, Meals on Wheels, their meal support increased by 16% at the time of uh, the study. Uh, that might be more now because as time goes on and people, more and more persons lose their jobs, um, more and more businesses find it harder to stay 
uh, alive to stay sustainable, um, we're going to see more of this. Um, the NAU increased its assistance to families by 165%, quite significant. They're now supporting, I should say up to two weeks ago, they were supporting um, uh, 975 families or almost 4,000 persons. That number also is likely to be higher today and we shouldn't be surprised if it's more than 4,000 persons by now um, receiving help from the, from the NAU. Resilience came on, um, really, really striking result. Um, within three days of launching, uh, that organization saw around 4,000 persons approaching it for help in different areas. Um, so that's, that's quite significant um, result in terms of what happens on, to the community. So we're going to open up for questions. I thought that might be the most um, interesting part of the discussion rather than you just hear me talking. But I want to talk a little bit about what, what we've learned from all of this and where we might go from here. Um, I don't have a crystal ball and, and I don't have all the answers either. I don't think any of us does. Um, but one of the things that really stood out for me was, you know, our local food production. So while we'll always import most of our food, because we have to because we're a small country um, with a lot of people and we don't have the economies of scale to do otherwise, we can produce more local food. And so one of the, the results from this, and certainly um, you will, if you just Google this, basically you will see a lot of other countries having identical reflection, which is on agricultural production, um, support of agricultural production, protection of agricultural production, and how that would make things a little bit easier when we have this type of crisis. The increased ability of local businesses to sell online products and services. Um, it's not just for efficiency purposes, but it's also um, very valuable in, in this type of crisis because you can't interact with your customers. Um, uh, I don't believe that the local um, business community has sufficient um, capacity online, um, meaning that there are a lot of retailers who sell items on a shelf or provide services and who could sell those services without physically interacting with a customer uh, sometimes, maybe a lot of times, in some cases, 50% um, of the time. Um, but there are not a lot of businesses who are actually properly physically selling goods online. And the most important constraint to that is being able to accept payments seamlessly online, being able to get set up properly in a low cost manner um, without too much red tape, um, you know, and getting a, a, a proper arrangement with a bank. Um, that allows you to start accepting um, payments online. So that's something that even though we're using it now to survive, it's actually something that we should probably reflect on trying to improve going forward and having more businesses um, carry out uh, e-commerce going forward. That would make the economy a lot more efficient. Um, and it does not necessarily mean that we're going to be losing lots of jobs because jobs would then be focused on other things and getting inventory ready and uh, dealing with customers online and processing and technology and lots of other areas. There can be new jobs, but it, 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 does, it does show that, for example, if the government decided that certain businesses would get um, exempted, say, next week or tomorrow, uh, on the basis that they could sell their services without, with, while minimizing interaction with clients. There are a lot of businesses who will not be able to take up that opportunity because they just don't have the infrastructure in place. And lots of restaurants have it because that's in their, already in their nature and they're accepting the cards and so on on the phone and so on. But a lot of other businesses um, didn't do it until the, the crisis. You saw some supermarkets that were not previously online all of a sudden they were and you could go through and you could click on the items and say, I want to buy this, I want to buy that and so on. So that, I think that's a very important lesson from all of this that we should try now and improve to improve that. Um, our domestic economy is very reliant on the international markets for tourism and financial services. Uh, we're not going to be able to um, reduce that reliance uh, a lot but we can, we can reduce their reliance somewhat. So the question is, um, what can we do to diversify our economy? And so 
we have to ask that question because in a crisis like this, um, while there is tourism and financial services, is there anything else that we could be doing that would make our domestic economy stronger? The engine that we're going to have going forward, as everybody knows, is financial services and anybody who is able to, to operate now, right? And the truth is not a lot of businesses will be able to operate uh, right now, at least not in a current environment. I think when we go to another level in terms of our, um, the, the government's preparations and what they think the, the risk is, then we'll be able to open up a lot more. But the question is, with the borders closed and with no tourists coming in, where are the customers going to come from? And if the customers are local, okay, fine. Do we have the services and the products uh, available for the customers? Um, you know, do we have enough substance to generate a, a decent domestic economy for a few months without all of those um, international visitors? So we have to look at how to diversify. How can our national disaster response plan be improved after the experience? I think that's a big question. I know, for example, that the chamber CEO will sit on, on these committees um, and he chairs one of the subcommittees as well on that. But the question is, uh, you know, what can we do uh, differently, right? Um, how can we be prepared for a crisis that, isn't, that has nothing to do with physical destruction but just, just you know, forces us really to, to stay home, right? Um, medically, what do we need to do? Do we need to make sure that we have a stock of masks? And you know, what, what do we have to have in place to make this work? Um, I think we've learned a lot. I'm pretty sure that our um, National Disaster Committee has, has learned a lot. And so um, in terms of what to do and what not to do. Um, what impact will this have on our pensions? Well, we already know, we already know that um, <coughs> This particular situation here uh, will result in a number of persons, I don't know how many, um, drawing on their pensions. And what does that mean for their future? I'm sure it's going to have some sort of impact, potentially significant in some cases, particularly when the pension itself, the pension fund itself, um, is not substantial anyway. So being able to withdraw um, a potentially large amount from your pension, how does that impact you going forward? Um, so that's another, another thing to reflect on. I'm going to stop there. Um, there's a lot more information, but I think that will probably come out in the, in the Q&A session. I think that's probably where a lot of the meat is. So I'll pass you on to Will now to, um, to moderate this part of the session. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, we've got some questions on the chat, so I'll go through some of them already. So one of the first questions is, is the lockdown period defined as local curfew only or border closure also? Yeah, so the lockdown period, um, it's, the border closure is, this, is the, the superseding one, so that's the highest level one. But it refers to the need for us, basically the shelter in place measures, the need for us to uh, stay home, that we can't move freely, so there's no there's, no, there's very little economic activity because we, we're not allowed to go anywhere unless we're buying gas or food or seeing a doctor. Um, although thankfully that has changed recently. So yeah, it includes both. And the next one is, um, what were the limiting assumptions of the survey? Uh, the, the survey itself, I think the, 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 only, the only thing I would say about the survey in terms of limits would be maybe the sample size. But that sample size itself was, um, was fairly large. Uh, the survey uh, was not just uh, chamber members. Um, that would have been another limiting fact if it was just kind of catering to just a few persons or, or for types of businesses. But it was actually opened up to the, the wider business community. Um, so there were, there were lots of persons there. Um, the other thing I would say about the survey in terms of limits, constraints, and sort of concerns, limitations would be that obviously it's, it's, it's literally just a sample. Um, so I don't know to what extent we can sort of roll that sample right up to a general population. I'm confident saying that um, the sample was representative in the sense that it, it just captured the actual um, concerns and activities of, of over 300 companies that employed almost 20% of the labor force. So from that point of view, again, 
if you're able to sample 20% of anything, that is a fairly, fairly decent sample. There's still gonna be statistical errors. And finally on the survey, um, I think you have around, um, I think it was a 5% margin of error. So 95% confidence interval. So yeah, there's a 5% margin of error either way on the survey results. Another question is, um, do you have any indication of what the impact of the tourism fallout will have on U.S. dollar supply? Um, that is a really, really good question. Um, I can tell you that it, it's, it's, it's significant. Um, it's certainly significant in other countries. I've done research on this already. In the Caribbean, there's a major concern there because that's where they're getting their, um, their foreign exchange from and um, they're getting it from, from tourism. So that's quite significant. So I think in our case, we should expect, we should expect something similar. Um, I'm not overly concerned um, because there's still some activity. Um, there's obviously still financial services as well, and that's an international service and, um, as well. So, but I, I think it's, it's, it is a concern. Um, it's a concern you have less US dollars as well circulating. I don't see any impact on our ability to maintain our current exchange rate regime though, which is fixed, um, at least not for now. Then a lot of question about tourism, we've got a couple of tourism questions. So yeah. which subsectors are included in your heading tourism on your various graphs and statistics? Is it right. only so, those two ESO economic statistics, office classifications, bars and restaurants and hotels and condos? Yeah, so all of the categories um, that the ESO uses. And then in addition to that, I consulted also privately with the head of the ESO to get um, ideas because they have a lot of really good internal info that's not available to the public. So what he, they were able to do was to give me an idea of the percentages of other industries that are related to tourism. So for example, if you look at the small business sector, other sectors, you were able to say, trap, you look at those sectors and say, what portion of, of that sector is usually services to the tourism market? So I took the ESO main data as well as the assumptions on um, the assumptions on, on how the other industries contribute and for tourism as well. A good examples are like transportation, um, storage, all of those are sort of subsectors but all of those that have an impact on tourism. So I knew exactly what the percentages were for those sectors. And I attributed that also to tourism. So tourism is not just hotels and restaurants. It includes also the, the contribution of other sectors in tourism as well. As part of that question, the person went on to say, um, tourism categorization includes other subsectors, as you pointed out, primarily involved in tourism, such as the cruise passenger, and cruise spending, watches, jewelry, clothing. There's a whole list that the, the person has provided. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's what you were looking at with when you spoke to the Economics and Statistics Office. Yeah, we were able to get a really good idea about those other sectors. Now, having said that, the reason I, I, I think that's a very good question is having said that, there are also going to be other areas where, you know, these businesses are in the tourism or servicing tourism, but we just don't have it captured in official data. For sure, many small businesses, right, are gonna be captured. Um, some of those businesses might not even complete the, the national account survey that the ESO sends out, but I'm sure they're there selling food, um, t-shirts, you know, arts and crafts to, to tourists. So they depend on tourism. So um, the, the, the final tourism impact, and I actually mentioned this in the report a few times, is, is likely to be greater because we don't have the official data um, perfectly segmenting the, those other sectors' contribution to tourism. But what, what I did was to ensure that, that we captured most of it. I consulted directly with the ESO to get additional data to bring some of those other sectors in. The next question deals with the, basically said the presentation was very clear and also very predictive. The negative impact is very obvious. Your presentation brought the facts to the fore for now, even though in theory we had, um, I didn't finish it. But I guess, guess the general question, Paul, is you know, the way forward. 
um, now that we've done the report, uh, what do you regard as the next steps in, in this whole process of understanding how we get back up and running? Yeah, I mean, uh, the way forward is, uh, is, is a really big question. Um, I know the government is talking about um, the, you know, the, how they have a plan and, and they have uh, procedures for rolling stuff out. Um, I, I, I think we're, we're going to be in, a, in this mode for quite some time. Um, having to refocus our energies internally, for me, is, is part of the, the key uh, results of this. And for many months, we're going to have to refocus internally. Um, one nice positive is that financial services will continue. So we have thousands of jobs that are going to be protected. Um, we hope that thousands of jobs will continue to be protected in the public sector as well. Uh, and then, you know, we have to deal with the fallout. Mm -hmm. um, I have concerns. I'm concerned that um, the, if we lose too many persons um, because, they, you know, they don't have a job, right? So they have to go home and they have to go to their uh, country because they, they have to find the support networks over there. I'm a little concerned that if too many of those persons leave, and I think they should leave if they don't have a job, I'm not suggesting that they shouldn't. But if we lose many, many thousands of people because they just don't have access to a job, that is going to impact our ability to, to resume. It's gonna impact the ability of, of the economy to resume because um, it's, sort of, it's sort of a coin with two sides, right? And on one side of the coin, um, the government is not able to support um, for example, workers on a work permit, um, they don't have the resources, they don't have the financial resources to do that. So it's good that they can you know, go back home and get support from their families wherever they are. So that's a positive financially. But the negative economically is that that means that there are thousands of persons who have left and can no longer be consumers um, with whatever savings or pension or whatever it is that they have because some persons that do leave will have some spending capacity when they leave, right? That's the reality. They just won't be able to stay here for a while, so it makes sense for them to leave the island. What that means is that when we turn our attention to um, resuming and recovering, we'll find that it's much slower. It's much slower because it's not so easy to just press a button and all of a sudden get your customers back in. Why? Because you've lost a third of your customers. You've lost 20% of your customers. You've lost half of your customers. So you don't get to just press a button and start doing business, right? Um, the second part of that, that um, and I, I'm not saying I have the solutions to it, but I just a concern that I have in terms of the way forward is there are some sectors that we're going to rely on to be able to, quote unquote, press a button and start to do some business. For example, construction. Everybody acknowledges that maybe construction will be able to resume because they were in the middle of projects. The flip side of that coin is, are all of those projects still viable? Um, are the investors still interested in completing every single project that they were initially working on, knowing that, for example, if, some, if a project was a, an apartment complex, there'll be less um, persons to rent it, or that the rental rates are going to drop, which we expect them to drop um, significantly. As, as long as the lockdown continues, rental rates will continue to drop. So there are flip sides to all of those coins. Um, so my, my concern and, and the, my feeling on, so as far as the solution, is that we have to try to see if we can absorb the negative impact as much as possible. And specifically what I mean by that is every business, if every business could hold on for slightly longer, right? It has a massive impact on all businesses. Because if we all cut 30% of our staff tomorrow morning, it's going to be very difficult for any, the rest of us to continue or even to resume. If we are a little slower to do that, if we can afford to, to be slower in doing that, it's going to be much better for the country, much better for the economy, and much better for all the other businesses as well. Now, that's easier said than done because as you saw from the survey, um, a lot of businesses have already made that decision because they had to. It's the reality of the situation. And I, I fear that many more will feel now, this is almost two weeks, uh, two weeks after the survey, that, that they, they, um, they'll have to do the same as well. So I, I'm, that's my concern um, about how we can go forward. 
uh, I think those, those are the big picture issues. Um, my other um, sort of going forward point is that what I'd like to see, I'd like to see the Cayman Islands look at a new plan under the new normal, a new economic strategy, one that fits in with where we are now and the crisis that we're facing, one that um, sort of prepares us for something similar going forward as well. So I think we can look at that. We may have to adjust some of our plans and I'd love to see an exercise, countrywide exercise where we, we look at that. There's a lot of great questions, keep them coming. Um, the, the next one really, I guess it dovetails nicely into how you responded to the last one, but there were some questions about the real estate sector, Paul, and the impact that this crisis is having to have on real estate. What's your perspective on that? You've already said that we're going to probably expect some rental uh, property prices to be adjusted because of the crisis, but do you think it'll have deeper impact as we go forward? And I think it will. There's one really, really fascinating thing about real estate and Cayman, and there must be, I hope there's some real estate experts online. They, they can, they can um, confirm this or, or correct me. But the long-term picture in real estate in Cayman has pretty much been always one direction, literally one direction. It's the value in real estate has just continued to go up. And I'm, I don't sell real estate, so I have no vested interest in this, um, but it's, it's actually really, really, um, uh, a really nice uh, feature. Um, there are other countries, the real estate market has been up, it has tanked, it has gone back down, it stayed stable for a bit, then drop again, then there's booms and buses. And while we have those blips, the general value of real estate in this country, uh, the market, it continues to be positive. So I think the long-term impact on real estate is gonna be okay. The short-term impact on real estate is already, we're already seeing it. Rental rates are already dropping. And I think those, the impact on values is also going to be there as well, unfortunately. Um, and that's just a direct you know, reflection of, of the market, right? It's a case of there's just less demand. There's more supply and less demand where you're going to have falling prices and, and you're going to have fallen value because uh, rental income um, contrib you know, is, a, is an input into value of real estate as well. Thanks. The next one is, it's an interesting question. Um, do you think the government should look into raising debt at this time? And that's a suggestion that came from a leading Caribbean economist. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I reflected on that. Um, and uh, and I, I sent a note to a friend of mine. In fact, I can send a note to someone in government as well, but on this. So the general idea behind that suggestion is, is this. First of all, all countries need money, they need capital, they need funds to try and support the economy at this time. Everybody knows this and governments are spending huge amounts, you know, billions of dollars in stimulus packages. So the natural and the second part of that is that money is also very cheap right now. Interest rates are extremely low in some places like in a negative region almost. And so money is cheap right now. However, my view on this, um, I, I feel very strongly on this actually is that while we need to do what we can to support the economy and maybe some borrowing might be necessary, I personally um, would not want to see the government borrow a lot. I would want borrowing to be kept still to a minimum. I don't think we have the wherewithal, the capacity to pump a billion dollars into our economy. And here's the reason why. After raising that money, borrowing that money, it has to be repaid. The government has to repay it. And then we're going to go back to the years, let's say eight to 12 years ago, where we have debt that we have to service. We're falling short each year in government finances. So what do we do? We raise fees. We raise fees. You raise your license fee. You raise your garbage fee. We, we, we raise the fees on the financial services firms. And I mean heavily. And we raise the fees on businesses. And we do all this, uh, the country does this, not because it, it's trying to hurt anyone, but because it's trying to survive and it's trying to balance the budget. So with more debt, we're going to have increasing debt servicing. And yes, I'm assuming increasing debt servicing, even with the low interest rates, it would be very unhealthy for us, very, um, I would say almost irresponsible of us to launch into any massive debt at this point. Now, do we need to borrow? Yes, we may need to borrow. And is that needed? I think it's needed in some sectors. I think there are lots of businesses that could get more support. 
but we're not talking hundreds of millions of dollars here. That's not where I would go. Um, I also don't like the idea of sort of just borrowing just because we can get cheap money and putting it aside. Um, I don't think, I think the interest rates have been low, not just this year or last year. It's been low for almost 12 years. And um, it's a relatively low interest environment for a long time. It's likely to continue like that for a while. And that's not me. That's just all economists everywhere um, and financial experts everywhere predicting low interest rates for lengthy periods. So I wouldn't encourage heavy borrowing. I would say it's okay to do some borrowing, but I wouldn't encourage heavy, heavy borrowing because it's different strokes for different folks, right? I think it's horses and courses. It's we, in Cayman, we're different. We're not a, a large economy where the government can let basically print a billion dollars and just kind of put it all out there. It doesn't work like that. We have to be responsible as well. We're small and we can't sustain those, those type, that type of spending and those types of shocks. And we certainly have worked really hard to get the debt down. So I don't have an issue with us borrowing, but we should ensure that we don't borrow really large amounts. This leads into the next question, which is another good question. As you know, the Premier does daily press briefings, and he suggested that the pension drawdown could inject as much as $500 million into the economy, which, again, uh, some, one, of the, one of the participants in this call says that's pretty much unrealistic. Even if you have 20,000 people drawing an average 10,000, that would only be $200 million. So What are your thoughts about... Uh, the use of that pension money and whether that is a stimulus. I mean, I've even seen real estate companies right now encouraging people to use some of that pension money to buy real estate. Mm -hmm. I, it, it, will, it will serve as a stimulus. I mean, I, I, don't, I haven't seen any study on the numbers and I, so I don't know if it can literally pump, you know, four or five hundred million dollars into the economy. Um, but I, I think it will, it will help. It will help in terms of the lack of expenditure. Um, this study, I didn't put that slide up, but this study shows that we're going to lose anywhere from just under around 250 to $500 million in salaries, right? Depending on the lockdown scenario. So that's a lot of money. That's a lot of spending that's not in the local economy. You also have to recognize that you know, workers don't spend all of their salaries, right, in the local economy, right? Some work permit holders will remit some of those funds overseas back home to their families. Uh, a few of us uh, might even try to save uh, some of our money as well. And of course, we're always importing goods from everywhere else. But that said, you know, a large, large amounts of that, those salaries are spent here. Everybody knows that rent, or housing expense, uh, electricity, and healthcare are some of the biggest parts of our budgets, our family budgets, our personal budgets. So being able to access the pension and then being able to kind of counter some of that loss in salaries, I think it, it's a good thing. I don't know about, you know, the long-term future of the pension is another issue, but I'm, in the short term, I think being able to access some of those funds is gonna be good. When I said earlier that if all the businesses could take a little bit of the pain, I was suggesting that if we could all hold on a little bit longer, then all of us would benefit immensely. Um, that's one air, one thing that helps us to, to hold on, hold on for a little bit longer. I'm already aware that there are some smaller businesses and the owners are looking at using their pensions to help to pay staff to keep staff on. I'm not, I'm not going to judge whether that's good or bad. I'm just saying that has a positive economic impact because it means that we don't have massive job losses because somebody is willing to, to, to keep a staff member on for six weeks or eight weeks because they have access to their pension funds. Yeah, the, um, obviously the, the pension amendment law that was passed not only allows you to get up to 10,000 of your pension, but it's also 25% of the other balance. So the calculation could be much higher than uh, the amount in terms of what could be injected into yep. the economy. But the other thing that the people on the, this, this uh, webinar want to find out about is they're really asking about economic diversification. Um, you know, except from agriculture, which is the obvious one, you said early in your presentation, it's going to be really challenging for diversification. But maybe you can kind of outline what do you think is necessary, for example, for us to move into the digital economy? 
I, I think uh, diversification is, um, I do think that even though I said it was a small part of the sector, I think there are opportunities for, um, for food, for agriculture. I think there are some opportunities there. And the second area um, we, which we need to address, I mean, if I was uh, responsible for this, or I would suggest the chamber, we need to get together with, um, with the banks to discuss very specifically the challenges with people, um, businesses being able to get online and get the proper type of merchant account um, to be able to sell, sell right away. Um, because there's a lot of risk aversion in this area. I know some of the banks are offering services, but others are risk averse. It, it just all the hoops that you have to go through to do that. It, it just shouldn't be that way. Not in a country like this, we're supposed to be very advanced and we should be much more advanced than that now in terms of um, the ability of companies to sell online. And I'm not talking about the logistics. I'm not talking about the technology of going online. I'm not talking about the website development. I'm talking only about the ability to accept the payments and have those payments settle seamlessly into your bank account. I think as a country, we have to now address that and address it like a proper problem. Talk to the banks about what it is that they need to um, make them more comfortable, make it easier, because it's really keeping the country back, frankly. Um, we should be able to do that. And I think that's something that we have to address fairly urgently. I have a question from somebody who's raised their hand named Richard's iPad. So I'm gonna unmute your mic and uh, let you ask your question. Richard? Richard? Go ahead, Richard, ask your question. Oh, sorry, hi there. Uh, th thanks for that, Paul. Uh, you brought up correctly about the need for greater food dependency or the opportunity for greater food dependency. Uh, what about the potential opportunity in di on the topic of diversification on greater energy dependency, which could impact, which will impact economic flows and U.S. In reserves? Um, then, is, what, what, do you see this as a real opportunity to change it? do a proper change in this country towards cleaner, renewable energy. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point. Um, I, I, I agree 100% basically is my answer to that. I think there's an opportunity for us to, to look at that. One of the things that I, I've looked at in, in terms of um, sustainability is that as I mentioned earlier, and you don't have to take my word for it, you can look at the ESO data, but basically fuel electricity comprises such a large portion of our budgets, whether it's a business or a household or an individual, that we do have to work on that solution. Um, like ASAP, I know that there is a target, Richard, I don't remember exactly what the target is, but a target to for us to be on renewable energy by a certain percentage of our energy in renewal, renewables, um, by 2037, I think it is. Um, I don't know that we're on target for that. I, I, my guess would be that we're probably not. Um, so I, I agree with you fully. Uh, it's a massive opportunity for us because it makes financially and economically much more sustainable um, if we can get, get those costs down. Obviously, it's also good for the environment. But in terms of the economics of it, it's a very obvious winner. Well, thank you, Richard, for that question. If anybody else has a question that you want to uh, verbally deliver, just raise your hand and I'll introduce you into the conversation. The next question deals really about, uh, again, it's from the chat. Uh, government's talking about opening up the construction sector soon. So the, the person asked, what impact do you see this having on kickstarting our local economy? I think it would be good to get have any activity get any activity started. Um, my concern about it is just that I think there's a little bit of an assumption that um, you know all the contractors are just sitting there ready to go. I actually think it's not that simple. Um, I think there are some contractors who currently even right now may have issues with access to workers because those workers may have already left. Um, and I think that's a little bit of an issue, hopefully not too many of them. Um, I also think that, um, and I just want you to, just to follow me on this, like, think about a bank. I think about a bank that's financing a project and the project has typical drawdowns. So, you know, after this period, you get this amount of money after that period, or once the project reaches this stage, you get that amount of money and so on. <clears throat> Banks 
have been asked to, and, and they're doing a really good job with this, they've been asked to provide some relief to their customers, and they've been doing that for the past six weeks. They have actually committed to doing that for, I think, three months, most of them, the retail banks. Um, and to the extent that they have to do that, we have to consider that, you know, this sort of money doesn't go on trees, so they're going to have their own financial sustainability issues as well. They will now have to manage going forward, um, irrespective of what happens with the concessions. They were going to have to manage their loan portfolios. They're going to see higher rates of default, right? They're, they're guaranteed to see that. And they're going to have other financial issues. So in addressing that, they have to manage their risk very prudently. And one of the areas that they're going to have to focus on is looking directly at the, uh, the projects that they're financing and tr considering very seriously the viability of each project that you're financing. So if someone is, was on a, on a quest to build 40 apartments, the question has to be, all right, so this is what you were planning to do. This is when you were planning to finish. You were planning to have this many persons rented and your rental income was going to be X. Are we still looking at that scenario? Well, the answer is obviously no, but where are we in that scenario? What, what's the new, what are the new set of projections? And can that, um, those new set of projections support the amount of money that I as a bank is gonna let, I'm gonna lend you? <clears throat> so I think you're going to see some challenges there in terms of, and I'm, I'm not just trying to be negative. I, I believe construction will, t will help us and we'll get off the ground. All I'm suggesting is that we need to temper our expectations about how much we will get from construction and real estate because uh, they're also impacted by the market. They're impacted by less customers, by lack of demand. They're impacted by bank risk management and requirements and so on. So we just have to be a little bit uh, more cautious in what we're expecting construction and real estate to do. But I, I think it's going to help us. Um, it's just going to be uh, just not, not so easy. I think the last, the last question, Paul, we're about at an hour now for the, this webinar. The last question is uh, the Jersey has, the island of Jersey has a rainy day fund in the hundreds of millions, according to this chat um, question. Should Cayman set up something in the future as the government it says in this chat message is unwilling to borrow to help local businesses. Yeah. I mean, I, first of all, I think, I, I don't know if the government is unwilling to borrow. Um, I, I haven't heard that, but if that's the case, then that's that. But um, I do believe that businesses need more support. Right. And I think that we can do, you know, carry out some borrowing to, to provide that support. I agree with the idea of a fund. Uh, maybe we should be building that fund now after this, and maybe we should have one in place. To the extent that we have a disaster fund, I would have thought that, I mean, a disaster fund could be drawn on for this scenario because it is a disaster, right? It's just medical, it's not a physical, it's not a hurricane, but it's a disaster and it's a national disaster. So um, if we don't have a fund like that, then we should really build one. I know that some private sector groups are now um, establishing such a, a, a vehicle, but um, I agree, I think we do have to have those in place, uh, we have to have it funded. We have to find a way to fund it. And then when we receive a crisis like this, we can act um, far more quickly and save more businesses and, and event, uh, eventually save more jobs. There's another question is that, do you think government should give a stamp duty waiver or reduction to support the construction industry in the real estate market? Um, well, yeah, subject to their government's own finances, I also support that. Um, I mean, I, I've always said that in this crisis, um, the government is not going to be able to, you know, to put half a billion dollars into our economy, but the government is probably going to have to defer tens of millions of dollars in revenues. They won't their revenues are going to decrease anyway because of the economy, but they're also going to have to defer, I think, some revenues to allow um, the economy to survive. So I support the reduction. I support waivers um, in terms of fees um, to help in the industry and uh, the construction industry. I think that's a good idea. The question is how much, right? And um, I, I can't answer that question because that depends on government's finances, but I think that's something that they should definitely consider. Well, thank you, Paul, for this excellent presentation. I'd like to thank everyone for participating and certainly your very provocative questions.
we're going to be hosting the next uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, webinar uh, on Friday. We're going to be dealing with the pensions amendment law, and we've invited the director of pensions and labor, Amy Wollaston, to be our facilitator. She'll be accepting your questions, and I know there are many questions about pensions at this time, so encourage Encourage your uh, people, anybody with pension questions, to, to tune into that presentation. So, on behalf of the Chamber Council and, and the membership generally, I'd just like to thank Paul for a great presentation. And uh, hopefully, in the future, we can have you back uh, when our economy hopefully starts recovering. Sure. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay, take care.